tonight, fatal floods. Thousands face Mother Nature's wrath in Bangladesh as heavy rains cause catastrophic flooding, taking dozens of lives and stranding many more. Heavy fire. Israel and Hezbollah trade round after round of ammunition as the threat of a wider conflict in the region escalates. Final stretch. Harris and Trump hit the campaign trail as the polls show a very tight race with calls for Harris to face the press growing louder. And run way ready. Cute Kojis take to the work of their lives, strutting about and putting on a show in time for the International Dog Day. All that are more as well news tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. Good evening, you're joining us on World News Tonight. Thank you for taking the time to tune in. As we come on the air to start off this week, we have for you a lot of updates on key stories that developed over the weekend and we begin in our region in Bangladesh. Severe weather is taking a toll on the population as at least 20 people died and more than 5.2 million in Bangladesh were affected by floods caused by monsoon rains and overflowing rivers. Villagers in Bangladesh waded through deep water on Sunday to get to safer ground as severe flooding triggered by relentless monsoon rains continue to inundate parts of the country. Officials say dozens of people have died and more than 5.2 million have been affected. Farmer Abdul Halim is one of them. He and his family fled their mud house days ago when a 10-foot high wave plowed through their village. On Sunday, Halim returned alone to see what he could salvage. He says he ate some rice two days ago and has barely eaten since. Many of the displaced have no food, clean water, medicine, or dry clothes. Halim says there's been little relief, especially for those in more remote villages. Authorities say as of Sunday, more than 400,000 people from 11 flood-hit districts have taken refuge in around 3,500 shelters. They say medical teams and the military are assisting in rescue operations, but blocked roads have hampered their efforts. The Bangladesh Meteorological Department has warned that flood conditions could persist if the monsoon rains continue, as water levels are receding very slowly. Yet more rains in our region continue to cause chaos in other nations as well. Over in Thailand, dozens were killed and many more were injured owing to earth slips across the nation. Rescue efforts continue to locate those buried under the rubble. As updates, we have other than the world news special correspondent Nevan Miranasinghe from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Nevan, what's the situation out there? Yes, Vinod. 13 people, including Russian couple, died in a mudslide on the Thai resort island of Phuket after calling off the search for missing persons. Phuket Governor Sofon Swarnanath said heavy rains last week set off the mudslides near the Big Buddha, a popular tourist destination in the south of the country. Besides the Russians, nine of the dead were migrant workers from Myanmar and the other two were Thais. About 20 people were injured and 209 households were affected by the mudslide. The governor said a major cleanup is underway, adding that the authorities were getting in touch with the relatives and the embassies of the victims. Back to you, Vinod. Thank you, and that was other than world news special correspondent Nevan Mirana Singer joining us from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Gunmen have killed at least 22 people in the southwest Pakistan after forcing them out of their vehicles and checking their identity. The attack happened overnight on a highway in Baluchistan province where security forces are battling sectarian, ethnic and separatist violence. The armed men checked identity documents reportedly singling out those from Punjab to be shot before setting the vehicles alight. The Balok Liberation Army, a militant group, has said it was behind the attacks in Mosakhel district. Interior Minister Mohsin Nakhvi said that security forces had killed 12 militants in operation after the attacks, but did not give further details. Over the past 24 hours, the BLA has launched a series of attacks on multiple government installations, including police stations and security forces camps across the province. In Kalat, 11 were injured, 5 of them security personnel and 6 bodies were recovered in another district in Balochistan. 
Tensions are ramping up in the Middle East as Israel and Hezbollah conducted cross-border attacks consisting of hundreds of rockets and fighter jets. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned of more attacks if necessary. Israel and Lebanese militant group Hezbollah exchanged their most intense fire in months, but pulled back despite fears from the international community of escalation into a wider war. On Sunday morning, air raid sirens rang through northern Israel as Hezbollah launched hundreds of rockets and drones in retaliation for Israel's killing of a top militant commander last month. Israel said it carried out a wave of preemptive strikes with a hundred fighter jets to thwart the attacks, with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu claiming that all of Hezbollah's drones were intercepted as a result. Lebanon's health ministry said three people were killed, and both sides stated that they only aimed at military targets, with Hezbollah's leader saying that the group targeted a military base near Israel's capital, Tel Aviv, in a televised address on Sunday evening. Netanyahu warns that this is not the end of the story, while Hezbollah asserted that this was only phase one of its attack on Israel but confirmed attacks were over at this current stage. This follows high-level talks in Egypt on a Gaza hostage and ceasefire deal, which included representatives from Hamas and Israel. Ceasefire talks are set to continue in the coming days, with United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres calling for a cessation of hostilities. But a Hamas delegation has reportedly left Cairo after talks did not reach a resolution on Sunday. The U.S. views the deal as being crucial to de-escalating tensions between Hezbollah and Israel, as the Lebanese militant group has said that it will only stop the hostilities once fighting in Gaza ends. U.S. President Joe Biden was reported to be closely monitoring the situation as it unfolded on Sunday, while U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin ordered two aircraft carrier strike groups to remain in the region and reaffirmed U.S. commitment to defending Israel. The United States was not involved in the strikes directly, but helped track incoming Hezbollah attacks. Hamas congratulated Hezbollah for its major response, while Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthi forces hailed it a courageous attack. Meanwhile, Gaza's health ministry has reported that 71 Palestinians were killed in Israeli operations just preceding the Sunday attacks. It also said that the death toll since the October 7th attacks has reached 40,405, with more than 93,000 Palestinians injured. An Italian prosecutor opened a manslaughter investigation into the deaths of the British tech magnate Mike Lynch and six other people who were killed when a luxury yacht sank in stormy weather off Sicily. An Italian prosecutor has opened a manslaughter investigation into the deaths of British tech magnate Mike Lynch and six others who were killed when a luxury yacht sank off Sicily this week. The head of the Public Prosecutor's Office of Termini Emerese, Ambrosio Cartosio, said while the yacht had been hit by a very sudden meteorological event, it was plausible that crimes of multiple manslaughter and causing a shipwreck through negligence had been committed. However, he said the probe was so far not aimed at any individual. The captain, James Cutfield, and the other survivors have been questioned this week by authorities. None of them have commented publicly on how the ship went down. Cartosio added there was no legal obligation for the captain, crew and passengers to remain in Italy, but authorities expected them to cooperate with the probe. Fifteen people survived, including Lynch's wife. His 18-year-old daughter Hannah was among those who died. Another prosecutor said the meteorological event that hit the vessel was most likely a downburst, a very intense downward wind that is a relatively frequent event at sea. They added that the passengers were all probably asleep at the time of the storm, which was why they failed to escape. Retrieving the boat may help investigators determine what happened, but it's likely a complex and costly operation. Cartosio did not rule out that someone could be put under investigation before the ship is salvaged, based on other evidence. Let's take a short commercial break, more world news on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump returned to the campaign trail this week with Harris kicking off a bus tour in Georgia and Trump visiting several battleground states. With the race reaching the final stretch, the polls are close and the stakes are high. 
Vice President Kamala Harris urged her supporters to get out there and fight for it as she concluded her presidential nomination acceptance at the Democratic National Convention. With both major party national nominating conventions now in the books, the 2024 edition of the race for the White House enters the final sprint. Both Harris and former President Trump, the Republican Party's nominee, will be back on the campaign trail in the coming week, along with their running mates making stops across some of the seven crucial battleground states that will likely determine the outcome outcome of the November election. It's a process that will be repeated each and every week until Election Day. The former president, his running mate Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio and their campaign and allied Republicans have repeatedly criticized Harris for not holding a major news conference or sitting for an interview since replacing Biden atop their party's 2024 ticket over a month ago. So all eyes will be on Harris to see if she lives up to her promise to do a national news media interview in the week left in the month of August. There's just one week left in August and the end of the month will bring anticipation of the latest fundraising figures from both the Trump and Harris campaigns. President Biden enjoyed the fundraising lead over Trump earlier this year, but the former president saw his fundraising soar in the late spring and early summer. NASA Chief Bill Nelson said two NASA astronauts who flew to the International Space Station in June aboard Boeing's Starliner capsule will need to return to Earth on a SpaceX vehicle early next year. NASA Chief Bill Nelson on Saturday said the two NASA astronauts who flew to the International Space Station in June aboard Boeing's faulty Starliner capsule will return to Earth on a SpaceX vehicle early next year. Nelson said the agency's decision is a result of their commitment to safety, as issues with Starliner's propulsion system made it too risky to carry the astronauts home. <laughs> Veteran NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams became the first crew to ride the Boeing spacecraft on June 5th in what was expected to be an eight-day test mission. Boeing had hoped the mission would redeem the troubled Starliner program after years of development and budget problems. The company scrambled to investigate what caused its thruster mishaps and helium leaks and tried to convince NASA officials that Starliner is safe to fly the crew home. However, results from tests and simulations raised more questions. Nelson said he discussed the agency's decision with Boeing's new CEO, Kelly Ortberg, who expressed his intention of continuing to work on Starliner's problems when it returns to Earth. Starliner will undock from the ISS without a crew in early September. Updates on the conflict in Ukraine now. There are some slightly positive developments as Russia and Ukraine exchanged 115 prisoners of war from each side after the United Arab Emirates acted as an intermediary. Video from the Russian Defense Ministry shows freed servicemen on their way back home after Russia and Ukraine exchanged 115 prisoners of war from each side on Saturday. <laughs> this freed Russian soldier spoke to his mother on the phone, telling her, Everything is okay. We are going home. According to the defense ministry, the Russian servicemen swapped were captured in the Kursk region, where earlier this month, thousands of Ukrainian troops smashed through the border in the biggest foreign attack on Russian territory since World War II. President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Saturday that Ukraine's operation in the Kursk region was a preventative strike to stop Russian attacks in the north and towards the city of Sumy. In video released Saturday, freed soldiers sang the Ukrainian national anthem while holding the country's flag and military flags. The Russian Defense Ministry expressed gratitude for the United Arab Emirates for acting as an intermediary in the swap. All released Russian soldiers went to Belarus, the ministry said, to receive medical treatment and rehabilitation before their physical return to Russia. Pavel Durov, the Russian-French billionaire, founder and the CEO of Telegram messaging app, was arrested at Le Bourget Airport outside Paris, and this was a part of a preliminary investigation relating to a lack of moderation of content on the app. Founder and CEO of the Telegram messaging app Pavel Jurov was reportedly arrested in France on Saturday. French media citing unnamed sources say he was arrested at Bourget Airport outside Paris. 
Jarov was reportedly traveling aboard his private jet. According to TV news network TF1, he was targeted by an arrest warrant in France as part of a preliminary police investigation. News outlets TF1 and BFM both said the investigation was focused on the lack of moderators on Telegram. Police apparently said that allowed criminal activity to go on undeterred on the messaging app. Reuters did not get a response for comment from Telegram, nor the French Interior Ministry and police. Russian-born Durov founded Telegram with his brother in 2013. With close to 1 billion users, Telegram is influential in Russia, Ukraine and the republics of the former Soviet Union. Its increasing popularity, however, has prompted scrutiny from several countries in Europe, including France, on security and data breach concerns. And since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022, Telegram has become the main source of unfiltered and sometimes graphic and misleading content from both sides about the war. Jurov, who Forbes estimates has a fortune worth $15.5 billion, said some governments have sought to pressure him, but the app should remain a neutral platform and not a player in geopolitics. Russia began blocking Telegram in 2018 after the app refused to comply with a court order to grant state security services access to its users' encrypted messages. Telegram, which allows users to evade official scrutiny, has also become one of the few places where Russians can access independent news about the war after the Kremlin increased curbs on independent media in recent years. Authorities searched for a man who set fire to a synagogue in the French city of La Grande Motte. The incident left one policeman injured. In the distance, a plume of smoke could be seen in the sky. It was not a forest fire, rather a suspected arson attack, which started at the front of this synagogue at around 8.30am on Saturday. Two vehicles burst into flames after a gas cylinder likely exploded inside. One police officer was wounded and the police presence scaled up around the site. French Prime Minister Gabriel Attal said the national anti-terror prosecutors had taken up the incident. And the Minister of the Interior referred to it as criminal. An attempted arson attack, clearly criminal, hit the synagogue of La Grande Motte this morning. I want to assure our fellow Jewish citizens and the municipality of my full support and say at the request of the president that all means are being mobilized to find the perpetrator. The town's mayor said that CCTV footage had captured images of a person setting fire to vehicles in front of the synagogue. Brazil was deploying military aircraft as a part of a war against wildfires ravaging the southeastern state of Sao Paulo, with authorities saying that arsonists were sitting blazes. Following a crisis meeting of President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva's cabinet, Environment Minister Marina Silva announced a war against the fire and said federal police were investigating a typical situation that has caused extensive damage. Smoke so dense, the horizon is difficult to make out. This is the result of record wildfires in Brazil's Sao Paulo state, with more than 3,400 separate blazes identified, according to the National Institute for Space Research. The smoke, which even reached the capital more than 700 kilometres north, has disrupted flights and road traffic. On Sunday, authorities said military aircraft were being deployed to battle the flames, including to one of the most threatened cities, Ribeiro Preto, with 700,000 inhabitants. Around Sao Paulo, farm fields have burned and scores of cattle have died. The governor said 1.6 million euros would go towards helping farmers who lost crops or livestock. Authorities were hoping that rain on Sunday would help alleviate the crisis. Prolonged drought in the region has aggravated the situation. Well, let's go in for a short commercial break. More real news right after this. Welcome back. As we celebrate World's Dog Day today, Lithuania hosted its third annual Koji racing event, drawing thousands of spectators to the Wingis Park, the city's largest open space. The event featured more than 100 Welsh Pembroke and Cardigan Koges from across Europe participating in a costume contest, a sprint competition and a 50-metre race. The park arranged a track near a stadium providing 6,000 seats for spectators to the watch proceedings. The event began with the costume contest where coaches appeared in various attires and were judged through live public voting. 
This was followed by the main event, a 50 meter race in which the dogs were classified by weight. The race included heats, semi-finals and a grand final. And with that we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. The stay tuned as Anuradhi Vikramasinghe will join you next with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.